Welcome today to Disciples of the Cross. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us, and I just want you to know I'm excited about this, our third video on our series entitled, The Message of the Cross. Uh, we have had two previous encounters with this topic, and we've defined the message of the cross as the gospel, Christ and Him crucified. And last video, we looked at what robs the gospel of its power? And those are the questions I want to deal with once again today. What robs the gospel of its power? Divisions? We looked at that last time. Today, we're going to take a look at the wrong object of faith as well as man's wisdom. Before I get started, please let me ask you to like, share, subscribe, uh, whatever platform you're on. Uh, let everybody know that we are here and and as well that it's available anytime you want to come to learn with us. So I'm excited about it. Share it, like it, subscribe it, whatever it is uh, that you do to make people aware and to make sure that you're following us uh, with the next video that comes up or the videos previous. We're also asking that if you have a question or a comment, please leave it uh, so that we can begin to address uh, those questions. Now, our question today is, what robs the gospel of its power? And we have to take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, where we begin to see uh, this truth. And the truth is, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, verse 17, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should become of none effect. You can see that uh, here in verse 17. What we want to be careful about is not allowing the cross to lose its power. And lest the cross of Christ should be made of non-effect tells us that it's possible for the gospel to lose its actual power. Well, what does that? In this particular setting, we're going to see that Paul says, Christ sent me not to baptize. Now, I've got to back this up a little bit, and, and uh, let me do that just here. I'm changing this up a little bit so it's easier for me to work through it. But as he talked about divisions last time, this time, as we look at the scriptures, he says this. He says, um, I thank God that I baptized none of you, uh, but Crispus and Gaius, listen, he should say that I had baptized in my own name and I baptized, and he goes on to say the household of Stephanus, and that leads up to verse 17, which says, for Christ sent me not to baptize. And let me get that highlighted for you as I play with it, because that's what we're going to talk about right now. Christ sent me not to baptize. Why did Paul say that? Baptism was a legitimate process involved in Christianity. Jesus told his disciples, go out and preach all the gospel to every creature, uh, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. So what in the world could possibly be wrong with water baptism? Well, that's just the key. There is nothing wrong with water baptism. There's nothing wrong with the practices of Christianity or the disciplines of Christianity. Uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, being committed to what the Bible says that we need to do. The Bible says we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God. So we should read the Bible. The Bible teaches us that we should never stop fellowshipping. Don't separate yourself from fellowship as the manner of some is, but rather increase as the time of the Lord's return comes near. So what why did Paul say, Christ sent me not to baptize? Because the object of someone's faith determines whether or not the power resident in the gospel is going to be working in their very lives. So when you start looking at water baptism or who baptized you or where you were baptized, you are altering the object of your faith from something that was needful, Christ, who he is and what he's done, to something that was a result of that. You, you see what you've done? You, you've simply changed and placed 
your faith in an action that you performed. Titus says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Salvation is not based on what we do. And when we think that salvation is based on what we do or some action that we perform, no matter how legitimate it might be, whether it's fasting or Bible study or church attendance or giving or Christian works or Christian service, when that becomes the object of our faith, when we're focused on that, I promise you our focus and our faith is not going to be centered on Christ. And when you take your faith outside of Christ and the cross, you take your faith outside of Christ, who he is and what he's done, and you shift it to even a good biblical doctrine or practice, then, ladies and gentlemen, what you have done is you have emptied the cross of its power because now it's not about what Jesus did for you. It's about what you're doing. And man, flesh loves this idea, oh, it's about me. Just tell me what to do. And then we start thinking that God works in our lives, not because Christ died for us on Calvary, but because I'm doing this, and I'm doing that, and I'm performing this function, and look how wonderful that I am in doing all of these things. Well, my friend, you could substitute the term baptize uh, for any Christian work. Christ didn't send the church just to read the Bible. He sent the church to proclaim the gospel. Now again, why? So that the faith of the individual listening to what we say would be centered upon God's redemption plan. And that is where the power is. Remember, Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power. The power's in the gospel. And when we change the object of our faith from what Christ has done to what we do and who did it to us or where we go to church, we're robbing, we're robbing the gospel of its power because the power of God is only going to be in the proclamation of Christ and him crucified. Number three, the last thief, man's wisdom. And man, we could spend all day long on this. Uh, man's wisdom is really described in the letter of 1 Corinthians from chapter 1 through chapter 4. And, 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 and the whole capsule of one through four is about will you walk in man's wisdom or in God's wisdom? Will you embrace what God has done or will you embrace what you do? But man's wisdom goes beyond that. We have figured out how to talk people in to being Christian. Or we've told them that if they just come into our fellowship, they would kind of morph into the Christian experience. My friend, the Christian experience is 100% absolutely, totally supernatural. It has to have outside power coming into the internal of man and transforming him or her into a new creation in Christ Jesus. That's the only way that it works. So all the programs, and all the processes that we have designed to try to make Christians is simply man's wisdom and it's opposing God's wisdom. God's wisdom was the cross. God's wisdom was sending his son to die. And so what's robbing Corinth, and boy, they have a whole world of problems there, What's robbing Corinth of the power to live this Christian experience is they're focused on their divisions. They're focused on what they have done, the wrong object of faith regarding what they do. And they're starting to lean towards programs and presentations that men come up with in their own minds instead of focusing on Christ, who he is and what he's done. Why is that important? 
When you focus in on who Christ is and what Christ has done, then the, co the gospel power that's resident begins to work in you. Remember that at salvation, once you are born again, at salvation, the Holy Spirit comes inside and begins to transform and conform, teach, lead, guide. Every born-again believer has this. Every born-again person has this internal ability given by God at redemption, at salvation, because of who Christ is and what Christ has done to learn and to grow and to be changed into the image of Christ. And when we focus on men, when we focus on what we do, or when we thirdly start producing thoughts of man's wisdom to produce or maintain Christians, we're stepping away from the internal supernatural power of God. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8 that the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Did you know that? Isn't that awesome? Isn't that wonderful? The same power that raised Christ from the dead works in you. So ladies and gentlemen, don't rob the gospel of its power. Don't make divisions a reality in your life. Don't have the wrong object of faith. Don't start counting on men's wisdom instead of godly wisdom. And let God's Spirit work in you. That's the power that is resident within the gospel, which is always Christ and Him crucified. All right, God bless you for today. I hope you'll join us next time.